Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm your host, John Lorden, and today we're going to discuss the case of the West Memphis Three. Now, um, it was fairly soon after I started doing these shows, these Brain Scratch shows, that I started getting suggestions for, hey John, you gotta cover the West Memphis Three, you gotta cover the West Memphis Three. And I looked into the case a little bit, and originally, um, I thought that it was a bit too graphic. There are some parts of it that, um, quite honestly, you know, YouTube and its advertisers probably weren't going to be too happy with. <laughs> but um, at this point, now that I've kind of grown with the channel and I have so much support from all you wonderful Patreon supporters, um, I'm willing to cover this case. And if I can't run ads, I can't run ads, whatever. It's, uh, it's an important case. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in it. And there's been a lot of other media created around it. So if you've been watching my channel over the past three weeks, you've probably noticed that uh, if you're a fan of my Geek and Dorks Review show, that I've been reviewing the films Paradise Lost. There, it's a trilogy, and I've gone through week by week and reviewed each of the three films. Um, they are very good documentaries about this case. Uh, admittedly, I'm going to just kind of recap my reviews a little bit. Um, the first one seems to be missing uh, a lot of tangible evidence, which is something I kind of look for, uh, particularly in documentaries that feature a lot of courtroom drama. I like actually hearing the pieces of evidence and how those pieces of evidence lay out the story. And that was certainly missing from uh, the first film. The second film takes a bit of a different direction. Uh, because of the popularity of the first film, they are now not allowed in the courtroom. So it gets a bit more interpersonal. It's more about the people and their feelings and thoughts. And it casts a pretty hard eye towards the father of one of the victims, one of the eight-year-olds that is killed uh, in the woods in West Memphis, Arkansas. Um, and then in the third movie, they kind of retract from that and they shift their focus to a different stepfather. Um, that is a stepfather of one of the victims and they don't go quite as heavy-handed but they certainly uh, try to lead you to concluding that at least the three teenagers that have been arrested and served over 18 years on this case are in fact innocent and Hollywood comes to the rescue there's there's a lot to be seen in those three films and if you're interested in shows like Brain Scratch I highly recommend that you check them out however I do also recommend that you do your own research on it after the fact because those films are certainly rolling with the presumption of innocence on the part of the actual West Memphis Three, the three teenagers that are arrested for this crime and charged with uh, murder. And after looking into everything that I've looked into today, I am a bit less certain. I mean, coming out of seeing those films, I was certainly also of the mind that, hey, it looks like there's a chance that they might be innocent. And I think there's an important distinction that I found throughout today, uh, researching all this information and watching all the films and everything. There is a big difference between saying these men are innocent as opposed to saying these men should not have been found guilty. That essentially law enforcement, um, the legal staff prosecuting them did not do their job properly to really close up these hoops of doubt um, that there was still some type of doubt out there and there might have even been well and then I'm sure your answer to that is yeah John but you had juries convict them you had two separate juries convict these guys true but if you look into the details of the case there um, those juries might have not been operating as they're supposed to in one particular case a jury foreman uh, was communicating with a lawyer that he already knew information about the case before he got the job there um, before he got the job as jury foreman, brought in information into the jury room that was not supposed to be discussed, and then it looked like they tried to omit it by um, blacking it out on the uh, paperwork that they turned in. So there are some very strange things going on in terms of the court proceedings here. There's also a huge cultural issue going on here uh, with satanic panic has been the <laughs> phrase that I've seen that's kind of grabbed my attention. You're looking at a, uh, a town that's in the Bible Belt. You know, you've got a, a very strong Christian following there. And you have teenagers 
who quite often teenagers will kind of backlash against the ideologies of their parents. So you have teenagers listening to Metallica, wearing all black, reading books on satanic practices or Wicca culture. And is it's weird because I feel like I knew people like this, and especially because the year that this happened, uh, the three children you can see here in the picture, uh, they were actually killed in 1993. That's the year that I was just coming out of high school. And uh, the guys that are charged with it, they're basically my age. Just uh, One of them's just a little bit older than me. So it's strange because coming up in that time, I was very familiar with the guys that would wear all black and color their fingernails. And they were always talking about you know doing witchcraft and going to meet at the park in the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. Um, Thank God I never personally had to deal with any tragedies of this nature around those types of characters. But those characters were around quite a bit in my youth. So um, the films definitely serve as a good little time capsule of seeing uh, how people were addressing youth in, in that culture at that time. And I think that that was a bit unfair in terms of how their court proceedings went because uh, they really painted a picture especially from the documentary and the footage they showed in the documentary. They, they brought in a supposed expert on satanic practices and they painted the picture that these three eight-year-olds were killed in some type of satanic ritual. And I gotta be honest with you, after everything I've reviewed, I'm just, I'm just not sure that that's the case. Um, but let's get started. Um, we're going to start with Wikipedia and just kind of use it as a guide to keep the conversation moving. There is just so much involved with this and there's so many legs that kind of branch off of the main story, rabbit holes all over the place. I mean, you could literally spend days just researching little pieces of it here or there. And please don't mistake that I'm using Wikipedia as a guide for this conversation and think that, oh, John's just reading us Wikipedia or that's all the research that he did. I have cracked into tons and tons of websites about this. I'm gonna share those resources with you so you can also review them. But I can't say that I've read everything. One of the websites in particular has so much information, it would take you weeks to process it all. So treat this as a primer to this story. We're gonna go through the basics. We're gonna talk about some of the different suspects. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of these great web resources that I found that are both for the innocence of the West Memphis Three and against it. And then we'll kind of wrap it up at the end and share. I'll share some of my thoughts with you guys about the conclusions that I came to. But to start with, the West Memphis Three are three men who were tried and convicted as teenagers in 1994 of the 1993 murders of three boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. Damian Eccles was sentenced to death. Jesse Miskelly Jr. was sentenced to life imprisonment plus two 20-year sentences. And Jason Baldwin was sentenced to life imprisonment. During the trial, the prosecution asserted that the children were killed as part of a satanic ritual. A number of documentaries have been based on this case and celebrities and musicians have held fundraisers in the belief that they are innocent. So let's jump down here. The crime. Three eight-year-olds, Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers were reported missing on May 5th, 1993. The first report to the police was made by Byers' adoptive father, John Mark Byers, around 7 p.m. Now let me just note that in the second film, Paradise Lost 2, John Mark Byers is who the filmmakers are trying to kind of paint as the suspect in potentially killing uh, these children. And he is certainly a very different type of character. He's kind of, um, he's got strong religious overtones, but if you look into his past, he has committed some crimes of his own. There's a mysterious death involving his wife that happens actually after all this, after she's gone through the grief of uh, losing her son. Um, John actually adopted Chris, if I'm, yeah, Christopher Byers. Uh, and there's just, there's so much strangeness around this guy. And in the movies in particular, um, it seems to me he really acts up for the camera. There's some scenes where 
you know, he's shooting at objects and wishing that they were um, the West Memphis Three. There's uh, scenes in the second film where he makes graves for each of the West Memphis Three out at the area where his little boy was found, lights them on fire, and he's stomping through them. Um, obviously, the man is dealing with a huge amount of pain, but how he, how he shows that pain whenever there's a camera around would make you think that, hey, this, this guy doesn't seem like he's playing with a, a full deck. The boys were allegedly last seen by their three neighbors who in affidavits told of seeing them playing together around 6.30 p.m. the evening they disappeared and seeing Terry Hobbs, Steve Branch's stepfather, calling them to come home. And that's important because uh, Terry Hobbs, let me bring up an image of him real quick. And this is Terry Hobbs, the stepfather. Um, John Mark Byers, the man that I was talking about that's uh, pretty radical in terms of some of his appearance on camera, uh, can be seen here. But back to Terry Hobbs. So when we get to Paradise Lost 3, the filmmakers shift focus and Terry Hobbs seems to be a, a bit of uh, who they're painting as a suspect. He goes as far as um, suing Natalie Maine of the Dixie Chicks because she's speaking out about this case and apparently uh, he feels like he was defamed. He loses that suit, uh, he's forced to pay I think $17,000 worth of attorney fees, but a pretty strange occurrence happens in that because as a result of him filing that suit, Natalie's lawyers are allowed to um, depose him or basically kind of interrogate him with this information because if there's any possibility to the reality of him committing these crimes, his whole lawsuit falls out the window. Um, and some of that footage is in Paradise Lost 3. So. Um, it's pretty interesting to see how he handles some of these questions. He also has a bit of a past, a little bit of violence weaved into his past, um, and the film certainly leaves you with the feeling that there is some potential that he might have been involved in what happened to these young men. A more thorough police search for the children began around 8 a.m. on May 6th, led by the Crittenden County Search and Rescue personnel. Searchers canvassed all of West Memphis, but focused primarily on Robin Hood Hills, where the boys were reported last seen. Despite a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder search of Robin Hood Hills by a human chain, searchers found no sign of the missing boys. Around 1.45 p.m., juvenile parole officer Steve Jones spotted a boy's black shoe floating in a muddy creek that led to a major drainage canal in Robin Hood Hills. A subsequent search of the ditch revealed the bodies of three boys. They had been stripped naked and were hogtied with their own shoelaces, their right ankles tied to their right wrists behind their back, the same with their left arms and legs. Now there's something about that detail that just doesn't quite sit right with me. Um, when I think about it, if I think about trying to hogtie someone to incapacitate them, I'm not sure why I would tie their right wrist to their right ankle. I would probably tie their right wrist to their left ankle so that there's a crisscross going on behind the person and that way they can't really, it, it would really limit their movement. If you hog tie their right wrist to their right ankle, what's going to keep it behind their back? There's nothing that really keeps their arm behind their back in that case. Uh, and they were hog tied apparently with their own shoelaces. So that kind of leads me to believe that uh, this crime is not premeditated. This isn't someone that was thinking, hey, I've got to get some stuff together and I'm going to go, you know, take care of these boys. Um, it was their own shoelaces that was used to tie them up. So I'm, I'm feeling like this was um, a, a crime that happened a bit in the spur of the moment. Their clothing was found in the creek, some of it twisted around sticks that had been thrust into the muddy ditch bed. The clothing was mostly turned inside out. Two pairs of the boys' underwear was never recovered. Christopher Byers had lacerations to various parts of his body, including a very dramatic injury to his groin, and I don't really want to go into it much further than that. If you watch the films, um, they even show pictures of what happened to this poor kid. Um, however, it kind of comes up in a few places. Um, Damien Eccles, when he was initially interviewed about this by police, uh, had made some claims to know, he, he appeared to know that one of these boys had trauma to their groin area. And I have read through the autopsy report of each of the three boys. And 
the lawyers kind of used that as, well, hey, Damien has inside information. There's no way anyone else could have known this, so he must have been involved with this crime. If you read through the autopsies of the three boys, you actually find out that two of them had trauma in that area. Um, not quite the same, not to the same extent, but two of them cer had certain identifiable trauma to that area. So it's weird to see a lawyer use that information to you know, help paint this picture in the jury's mind that this guy has insider knowledge. But if you dig a little deeper, if he had insider knowledge, he probably would have said, yeah, two of these boys were you know, hurt in that spot. But the autopsies by the forensic pathologist Frank J. Peretti indicated that Byers died of, quote, multiple injuries, while Moore and Branch died of multiple injuries with drowning. Which, another big point of contention in this case is, did the, did the murders of the children actually occur at this spot in the woods uh, where this creek was? And there's a lot of arguments that there's not enough blood there. Um, there was lacerations all over these young men. There was uh, a lot of trauma to the back of the skull, particularly the back of the head. Um, but knowing that two of them actually died of drowning in that area at least leads me to believe that uh, the final act of them being killed probably happened in that area. Now, a lot of people that um, don't necessarily agree with that point will cite the fact that there wasn't a lot of blood found at that location, and in particular for some of the trauma that was made to these boys' bodies, there should have been a lot of blood in that area. Um, we're gonna get to a source a little bit later that might help us clear that up. Just a little more about these young men. It's, um, you know, it, whenever I'm doing shows like this, I always try to present information that reminds all of us that these were human beings. These were little lives that really had yet to begin. And especially with how much, it's hard to say that this story has been commercialized, but it kind of has been in a way. I mean, the documentaries have won awards and, and things of that nature. There's another documentary called West of Memphis that was made, uh, I think with a, a bit more money. Um, there's even a Another movie that is a fictionalized retelling of this that was made kind of by big Hollywood. Um, but these were, these were real lives. These were three young boys that were out playing on their bikes. Um, you're talking about Cub Scouts and students. Um, so just really quick, they were all second graders. Stevie Edward Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore. Um, they went to Weaver Elementary School. Each had achieved the rank of wolf in the local Cub Scout pack, and they were best friends. Um, we do see here that a few of them, uh, Steve Edward Branch and Christopher Mark Byers, their families kind of broke up and they, um, they wound up being raised with uh, stepfathers. Although in Christopher's case, John Mark did actually adopt him, uh, it seems that James Michael Moore that his uh, family was actually uh, still together. He was still living with both of his parents at the time. Just kind of another sign of the type of area we're talking about. You know, this is a place where families are struggling keep, to keep together. Um, there doesn't appear to be a lot of money in this area. Um, I've heard quotes even from people that live there saying, we were poor white trash. In 1994, a memorial was erected for the three murder victims. It is located in the playground of Weaver Elementary School in West Memphis, where all three victims were second graders. In May of 2013, for the 20th anniversary of the slayings, Weaver Elementary School principal Sheila Grissom raised funds to refurbish the memorial. We have a little picture of it over here. So now we start looking at the suspects, Baldwin, Eccles, and Miss Skelly. At the time of their arrests, Jesse Miskelly Jr. was 17 years old, Jason Baldwin was 16 years old, and Damian Eccles was 18 years old. My impression um, from all the material I've reviewed is everyone considers Damian to be the ringleader. Um, he's the oldest of the group. He has a bit of a troubled past. If you crack into some of the websites that think that these guys are actually guilty, uh, they frequently bring up that the film skipped over a lot of um, detail about his mental health, that he had several hospital stays. Um, there was some pretty bizarre things that would happen in terms of him seeing uh, someone that had 
scratches on them and him trying to drink their blood and saying that he gained power by drinking other people's blood and stuff like that. Um, I know that that could be shocking to some people that haven't been exposed to that, but I just, I have to recall, I knew kids like this. I knew kids that did stupid, stupid things like this. And I'm pretty sure nowadays, one of them's a CPA somewhere or an attorney somewhere or something like that. I do think that sometimes, not all the time, sometimes that type of backlash against the culture of your parents is a phase that teenagers go through. Now, is that the case with Damien? Hard to say because you could look at his material nowadays and, you know, he seems to have adopted and held on to some of those traits. Not necessarily that I would consider him a Satanist, but he definitely dresses himself like a uh, like a heavy metal guy. You know, he's got jet black hair, it's long, he's got tattoos all over the place. Um, but is that enough? It's weird because whenever it comes to this angle of looking at the character of these men, I find it very challenging for me to take that ride where a lot of people do take that ride and they say, hey, of course this guy's guilty. Look, he's reading books on Satanism. He's, you know, painting his nails black or whatever it is. There is so much character assassination that happens whenever people look and discuss this case in all directions that it just it that, that kind of thing doesn't work for me. I'm really looking for the nuts and bolts of the evidence, of the physical evidence in particular, to help tell this story. And that's honestly been a big frustration point for me in looking at this case from the first minute that I started um, Paradise Lost all the way through now to me sitting here talking to you about it. The physical evidence in this case is a bit maddening. We're gonna we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, but. Um, quick background on Jason Baldwin. He was only 16 years old at the time. Hung out with Damien Eccles a lot. I think many of us would consider him the follower. Seems like a bit of a quiet, shy kid. Might be easy to talk him into doing certain things. Um, you know, he's a bit more outspoken nowadays. There are links down below where you can see, um, not recent, but kind of more later interviews with both Damien and Jason so you can get a sense of kind of where they both are now. And there's even an article down there specifically about what has happened to these three guys and where they all are now. In case that's any hint for you, they did actually get uh, out of prison. They are not serving those sentences anymore, but we'll get to that part of the story. Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. Um, this is probably the most interesting and controversial of these three because it was really a confession that he gave. And I have trouble calling it a confession. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, it's a confession that he gave that was a key piece of evidence in terms of implicating Damien and Jason. Now, not getting them convicted because his confession was actually not allowed in their trial. However, it seems like the jury foreman um, had that information prior to and shared it with the jury, which is extremely unfortunate. It might be enough of a basis for a mistrial, which is what I think they, they were worried about later on. Um, but Jesse Miskelly went through a long police interrogation and there's varying information on this. Um, you'll most frequently hear that he was being questioned by police for 12 hours in one shot. Um, people that think that the West Memphis Three are guilty will state, we've looked at the time logs that the police put out and we can see that um, the interrogation started at 10 and it ended at five. So you're talking seven hours. One way or the other, one thing that most people agree on is this Jesse Miskelly Jr. is not the smartest man alive. Um, he, he took an IQ test at one point, only came back at a 72. If this seems familiar to you, this feels a bit like the case in Making a Murderer with Brendan Avery where uh, he gave a confession that I know a lot of you and maybe myself believe um, wasn't true, wasn't accurate, that he was led to make that statement by the means and questions that were being presented to him. And this did come up in the trial a bit in terms of uh, Jesse Miskelly. Um, however, he was convicted. And what's kind of interesting is he was convicted to life plus two 20-year terms. And his confession, this is why I call it a confession, um, didn't state that he had anything to do with the murders. I mean, he was there. One of the, his, his statement is that one of the boys tried to run away, he stopped the boy and brought him back. 
but all of the trauma that happened to the boys, uh, particularly anything that had to do with sexual trauma, was supposedly done by Damien and Jason. So it's very, it's very hard for me because a lot of people um, are arguing this point about the confession. They're saying if he confessed once while the cops were beating up on him, yeah, they could kind of assume that maybe he would say something inaccurate there. But apparently he kept restating this up to four separate times after the fact when there was not detectives in the room. In one instance, his own attorney was there telling him, stop talking, stop talking, and he told the same story again. So there's people that believe that his confession is extremely true. Um, for me, I just, like I said, I have trouble calling it a confession because essentially all he's saying is, yeah, I was part of the group, but I didn't really do it. It was, it was those two guys. And yes, it was enough to get him a pretty stiff sentence. Um, and if he did do something, maybe it deflected that a little bit, but he ultimately wound up with a longer sentence than Jason did. Now, Damien was sentenced to the death penalty, so that's the ultimate. Jason was only sentenced to life in prison. So it's really weird just how this all shook out. Um, it just really gives me the feeling that the justice system, man, needs some serious tweaking and that cases are obviously not apples to apples because you have someone that, that helped give key information to the police that supposedly helped them chase down the leads and find the right kids that did this, but that guy gets life plus 40 years and one of the kids that is one of the main components to the violent act only gets life. It's just, it's really mind boggling. So moving along, just uh, different suspects. Real quick to recap, we also have the two um, fathers that I mentioned, so they're also thrown in this pool. But today I bumped into these names for the first time, Chris Morgan and Brian Holland. Early in the investigation, the WMPD briefly regarded two West Memphis teenagers as suspects. Chris Morgan and Brian Holland, both with drug offense histories, had abruptly departed for Oceanside, California, four days after the bodies were discovered. I did some searching on these guys and I bumped into probably the best resource that I could have found on this case. Let me bring it up real quick. It is a website called callahan8k.com. Of course, there's a link to it down below. But essentially, this is a website run by three men. Two of them think that the West Memphis Three are innocent. One of them thinks that they're guilty, but they don't discuss any of that on their website. All they've done is tried to collect as many official records as possible. Court transcripts, police reports, photos, autopsy information, everything is at this website. If you wanna dig in, this is the website to do it. And I so, so, so appreciate that there is no commentary going on in this website about who might be right, who might be wrong, who's innocent, who's guilty. It is literally trying to be just a clean presentation of all the information that was collected and presented around this case. And here I did find um, from the Oceanside Police Department a investigation report. Essentially they went and met with Chris Morgan and Brian Holland. Um, they conducted lie detector tests on both of them after interviewing. Chris actually got interviewed once, then was brought back for a lie detector test. It seems like Brian was brought in and given the lie detector kind of in one shot. Chris was then interviewed again about the results of his lie detector, which he failed, and he seemed to become very agitated. Uh, the detective leaves a lot of notes about strange things occurring like him uh, Chris covering the camera that's in the room with the tissue so he can't be filmed, um, some of the posturing he was doing, some of the quotes about, you know, this is ridiculous and, and things like that. Um, a few interesting pieces shake out there. First of all, that both of these guys failed the lie detector. Uh, second, they decided to go to Oceanside and pop in on his sister who lives out there who didn't know that they were coming. And the reasoning for that is, well, we were just going to surprise her. Third, this is happening a matter of days after these young men were killed. So in my eyes, these two are looking very suspicious. I am not sure how they're cleared. I don't know if that information is on uh, the Callahan website and I just haven't bumped into it yet. But for some reason, it seems like the West, West Memphis PD did not, um, obviously didn't try to prosecute these guys, but I don't even know how much they followed up on these guys as leads.
Mr. Bojangles. The sighting of a black male as a possible alternate suspect was implied during the beginning of the Miss Kelly trial. According to local West Memphis police officers, on the evening of May 5th, 1993 at 842, workers in the Bojangles restaurant located about a mile from the crime scene in Robin Hood Hills reported seeing a black male who seemed, quote, mentally disoriented inside the restaurant's ladies' room. The man was bleeding and had brushed against the restroom walls. Officer Regina Meeks responded to the call, taking the restaurant manager's report through the eatery's drive through window. By then, the man had left and police did not enter the restroom on that date. The day after the victim's bodies were found, Bojangles manager Marty King, thinking there was a possible connection to the bloody man found in the bathroom, reported the incident to police officers who then inspected the ladies' room. King gave the officers a pair of sunglasses he thought the man had left behind, and the detectives took some blood samples from the walls and tiles of the restroom. Police detective Brian Ridge testified that he later lost those blood scrapings. A hair identified as belonging to a black male was later recovered, from a sheet wrapped around one of the victims. Not a lot of information is known about this guy. As far as I know, he's never been identified again. However, in one of the websites I bumped into, um, they state that he apparently had one of his arms in a cast. Um, so thinking that he might be the culprit of this crime, of being able to subdue you know, three eight-year-olds, uh, seems a little far-fetched. And I don't know that that necessarily rules him out. It could be that there was other people there that he was assisting or that were assisting him. Um, I'd be very curious to know who this guy is and for him to just be processed and questioned, if nothing else. Uh, I can't imagine that that community is too big. You know, like, how did this guy just disappear? Once again, I don't know. But there's a lot of pieces of this case. And, you know, I think a lot of viewers of the documentaries will also agree it doesn't seem like the police department was doing the best job that it could have been in processing all of this. Um, admittedly, they might have been spread extremely thin. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of different theories going on here. Um, but there's some big holes. I mean, for example, like with Terry Hobbs, um, I know that his neighbors that lived just literally a house or two away from him that saw him, they say, they saw him that night with those three boys on their bikes. Um, they were never questioned, even though some of them had tried to reach out to the police. So it's, I don't know, um, this is one of those cases where I really wish that the police would have reached out to other resources and maybe got some help. There's even a note in this Wikipedia article that uh, the, state, um, the state police tried to offer some resources to assist with this investigation, and basically the West Memphis uh, PD declined that help, which... I, I just don't understand. Why wouldn't you take all the help you could get? As a matter of fact, you can see there's a whole section here on Wikipedia about criticism of the investigation. Um, it does seem, and even from some of the comments that are presented in the documentaries by law enforcement staff themselves, it does seem like they were very aware of Damien. Um, they were expecting him to do something like this at some point, and he just kind of fit the crime, um, almost like they profiled him into this crime, which uh, I don't think is, it's definitely not a scientific approach and I highly doubt if that's good police work. So a few things popped up, um, particularly, it's weird because they made Paradise Lost and then somehow that documentary kind of became part of the case. While they were filming it, uh, a cameraman for it was given a gift by John Mark Byers, the father of one of the victims, which happened to be a folding knife. And the filmmakers, upon returning home to New York, noticed that it seemed like that knife had some blood on it. So that blood was tested. Apparently they could only get um, what blood type it was from the testing back then. And it was determined that it did match the victim, but it also matched John. So um, he had a couple different stories. That's another thing that's very unfortunate about this guy, his stories uh, they don't always line up. It seems like he tells different stories here or there. Um, I still don't know to this day if that knife had anything to do with it. I kind of doubt it. One of his stories was that he cut himself with it. He cut his thumb. I think it's possible, um, but it, it's, it's very, very strange. Then there was uh, what some people thought were bite marks. And 
In the first Paradise Lost, you'll see some scenes in the courtroom where they're looking at wounds on one of the children and assuming that it had to, it had to be made with a belt that basically the buckle end of a belt was used to hit him and it left kind of an, an imprint um, that you could see over the top of his eye and then down below it a bit. Uh, in the second film, that information is kind of reanalyzed and they start to assume that it's bite marks. Now, one of the very, very strange things, with, which still has no explanation here, is John Mark Byers um, says that he got his teeth removed after these kids were murdered and now he wears dentures. So if those were bite marks that could be lined up with um, you know, basically an, an imprint of someone's bite pattern, uh, he would now not match that. And what's really strange, once again, is his storytelling because in that film you will hear, I think, three different stories about why he got his teeth removed. The time frame for when he got his teeth removed changes. He says, at one point, I did it before the kids were killed. At another point, nope, it was actually after the kids were killed. They f trace down the um, oral surgeon that did it, and apparently they did identify that it certainly happened after the children were killed, I think like four years after. How do you get that wrong? I really have no idea, and that certainly helps cast this, this light on him being a potential suspect through the whole second film. This also mentions Vicki Hutchinson's recantation. Um, I know I'm starting to run long, so I'm gonna to try to speed it up a little bit, but essentially there are a few witnesses that were used in these trials, and they have later said that their information was not accurate. That includes her, that includes a, an inmate of Jason Baldwin's, I believe, that um, now has done a full apology to Jason um, saying that you know that conversation never happened. He essentially said that Jason admitted to him that he killed these kids, uh, but has since taken that back. So it's really tough, especially when you're talking about someone that took the stand and you know presented false information. They're saying that they had feared law enforcement, that law enforcement was making some inappropriate threats about what could potentially happen to them, and that's why they made these false statements. But if you dig into the details of this, you're going, to, you're going to kind of bump into this time and time again. The rumor mill around this story is crazy. And you have people that are just, I don't know why, but they're making up these stories and then recanting them later. Um, and that takes this whole, that takes this, this whole community and just throws them in different directions over the past two decades. It's, it's really hard to see and, and watch from an outsider perspective. Um, I just, I don't know why people would do that. I, I mean, I get if you're in jail and particularly if you're on death row, what, if, what do you have to lose? Maybe you'll get a little press out of it. Maybe you'll pop up on the TV or something and that's a big thrill for you. I don't know. Um, but it just adds so many, so much mud to these cases and makes the truth so much harder to find. So finally we get to 2007 and some new resources come around because now you have all these filmmakers and Hollywood's knocking on the door of this story. Um, some new attorneys take up the cause, uh, new analysts start looking at everything, and we now have DNA tools. So um, they look at this crime scene again, and a critical point, which for me personally is very hard to let go of, is there is no DNA for Damien, Jason, or Jesse at the scene of the crime. Absolutely no DNA. Now some people say, well, the boys' bodies were put into the creek in about two and a half feet of water, so that washed away all the DNA. There, I don't know how viable that, that excuse is, especially when they were only in there for a day. Um, there's actually a kind of a counter complaint to that, that the crime scene wasn't processed right, and that the police, instead of calling the coroner, they wound up taking these bodies out of the water, and the coroner really should have been there before that happened, because as soon as they were removed from the water, they started decomposing more rapidly, insects were starting to get on them. Um, so it, it's very, very tough, and once again points to a process that isn't very well engineered for handling with these cases. But they do find a hair fiber that belongs to our good friend Terry Hobbs here that's actually tied up within one of the knots of the, um, the shoelaces that are, are binding one of these children. Now, 
I can't say it belongs to him specifically. It's a type of hair that he has, but it also accounts for like one and a half percent of the population. So literally millions of other people could be thrown into the pool of consideration of that hair being a match to them. Um, I would assume that from what I understand about hair analysis, uh, particularly with DNA, they have to have the root of it to do a pure match, uh, one of those 99.99999% matches. So I would assume that they probably only had a bit of the shaft of the, of the hair. Um, but that hair is found, as I mentioned before, there was the hair of a black male found at the scene. Um, there was also another hair found that's, that could be the same type, I think that's the best way to phrase it, as a friend of Terry Hobbs. And if you watch West of Memphis in particular, there's some pretty odd conversations that go on between Terry and this friend about that night. Uh, the friend seems pretty busted up. I mean, he's literally in tears at one point with the filmmakers talking about that night. So it's tough. It's not enough to, um, you know, it's not enough to convince me that they truly had something to do with it. Um, I get a strong feeling that if nothing else, maybe they know a bit more than they've been presenting about that. Now, Terry Hobbs actually has his own website where he's presenting his own side of the story. So if you want to check that out, I've also included it in the description box below for you. Um, I read through it real quickly. I didn't find anything super compelling about it. He's basically just copying and pasting from information sources that seem to agree with uh, his side of the story or him being innocent. Um, you know, it's got some poetry and some other things there. Uh, at the very top of it, it does have what I would consider a dedication to these three young men. So it's weird because after going through the ride of Paradise Lost 2, which I already had a weird feeling about in terms of them accusing uh, the buyer's father, uh, by the time they started accusing this guy, I had this kind of, man, you, you have to find better evidence than this to really do these kind of accusations in, in movies like this. Because um, the evidence just outside of testimony of people that supposedly saw him with those kids, once again, there's just not a lot of physical evidence and I don't understand why. There is an item out there, I believe, that was used to strike these boys in the back of the head. Where is that item? Now, um, there's more testimony from uh, the family of Terry's ex now ex-wife that they saw him washing clothes that night. There was some very strange behavior going on with him that night. Um, but once again, <sighs> were those clothes tested? Did they find ev any evidence of these children on them? No. One kind of important piece is his son had a pocket knife. And the mother knew how much the son loved this pocket knife. That pocket knife wound up in the nightstand of Terry's bed. And the mother is very suspicious of him because of that. His official explanation for that is he didn't think that his son should be using a knife like that, so he took it from him. So, I really don't know. So if you do watch the films, you will see WM3.org is frequently referred to. Unfortunately, the page is no longer around. I'm sure you can use the Wayback Machine if you want to go and check it out, but essentially this was the rally point for people that wanted to have this case reinvestigated and thought that the West, the West Memphis Three uh, were likely innocent. WestMemphis3Facts.com is, um, it's almost written like an essay, and I have to say it did a fairly good job in my eyes of presenting some compelling information to make you question the innocence of the West Memphis Three. It's not perfect in how it's written. Um, it once again gets into that level of character assassination that doesn't really move me a whole lot, but there is a good section, particularly about physical evidence. Um, there's a lot of information about Damien being a liar and they try to prove it uh, here and there. Um, you know, that, that type of impeachment testimony, it's one thing if it's done in a court of law, but you're talking about, a, a, he was a teenager at, in the instances, that, in some of these instances that are being brought up here. Um, you know, I don't think it's impossible to make the statement that some children lie, particularly if they're troublemakers. It's probably going to be pretty easy to dig up lies that they've made, particularly in their teenage years. So 
Um, that type of character assassination doesn't do a whole lot for me. Um, but there is a very important piece I found, and this is why I always want to encourage you guys, please, 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 if you are researching these things on your own, look at both sides of the story, because sometimes you'll find something there that's important to whatever side you believe, but you will miss it if you write off that information right off the bat and say, oh, this is just someone that's looking to hang these guys up. They don't know what they're talking about. Blood at the crime scene. So remember earlier how I was saying I wasn't sure if the um, crime actually occurred at that area? Well, they did a luminol test on this, and it actually refers back to that Callahan 8K um, page that I was telling you about. And if you look here, you'll see they have multiple links for photos of the actual luminol tests that were conducted out there. Uh, just to give you a reference, here's a reference photo. So that's kind of the side of the hill. So you can see in the photos here on the side of the hill, it does look like there's some splatter. Looks like there's a lot of splatter lighting up here. They have many photos that show that luminol is definitely detecting biological matter in these areas. Now, I do think you could ask the question, do we know if this is human blood or not? Um, has this been tested? I haven't found any information to that, but like I said, I have not reviewed it all and this brain scratch is going super, super long. Just to sum this up, we're gonna jump back to Wikipedia plea deal and release. After weeks of negotiations on August 19th, 2011, Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly were released from prison as part of a plea deal, making the hearings ordered by the Arkansas Supreme Court unnecessary. The three entered into unusual Alford plea deals. Now this Alford plea basically means that you can state that you're innocent, but you're also acknowledging that the case against you is so good they could probably convict you, but you're still innocent. So these three decided to take that deal instead of trying to fight it out and potentially staying behind bars for another one to three years. I mean, these trials take a serious amount of time and resources. So this was an arrangement that was made um, when the original judge, who basically denied every motion they had for any type of appeal after his original, uh, the original convictions came out, that judge got promoted to another job, a new judge gets in here, he says, I want to work this out, how do we work this out with these guys so that we don't have these court cases going on forever, we're spending money all over the place, and I think this was a very big consideration, if these guys were found to have been incarcerated uh, unjustly, well, if you've watched Making a Murderer, you know that people can sue the state at that point and make millions and millions of dollars. And even their own uh, legal team is seen in, I think it's in west of Memphis, um, he clearly states that, you know, they probably saved the state $60 million uh, in that case. These guys were probably going to get about a million per year that they were incarcerated each. <sighs> Crazy form of justice, huh? Um, so since then, uh, these guys have come out. They've, you know, helped produce these films. Damien Eccles is a co-producer on West of Memphis. Um, Baldwin helped produce the fictional one. I can't remember. I want to say it's tying the knot, but I can't remember off the top of my head. It stars Reese Witherspoon. I think that'll help you uh, find it if you want to search for it. They've been writing books making public appearances. I have a few appearances in the description box below so you can check that out. Um, there is apparently some kind of rift that has come up between Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. and the other two. Um, they kept asking him, hey, why don't you come and be part of all this? You know, we're getting these jobs, consulting on these films and stuff like that. And he actually apparently went back to that part of West Memphis and he's just been living a bit of a quiet life and trying to distance himself away from Damien and Jason. So I don't know what that means necessarily. I think you can kind of draw your own conclusions around that. Very tough case. Um, one thing's clear, the true murderer of these children is not in jail. Uh, so has justice been served from the perspective of these three kids that were killed? I don't think so. Uh, is there a chance that justice has not been served at all, that the killer was never in prison, didn't spend one day in prison for any of this? I think there is a possibility of that. I'm honestly about 50-50 right now, 
in terms of did the West Memphis Three do it or is it someone else? The evidence against them, if you go look that way, um, there's some pretty compelling things there and it definitely counterbalances uh, the Hollywood take that we've seen in Paradise Lost, the Paradise Lost series and West of Memphis. So um, it's very tough. It, it really is. If you're open-minded, you have to look into this a lot more. Like I told you, I could probably look into this thing for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I don't know if I would be any clearer or just more confused and have more points to debate back and forth. There are people that have literally been investigating this case for decades now, and uh, I think even they are still having disagreements around this. So. This is where I turn it over to you and where we can continue the conversation in the comments section below. So please check out all the links I have for you down below. Do your own digging, do your own research, make your own conclusions, share them with me in the comments. Please be sure to bring up any other links that you think are important for the rest of us to see and add them down there so we can check them out. Thank you so much for joining me on this kind of long but I really wanted to do it right, and I hope that this is a good primer for many of you if you've never heard about this case, uh, this big, long version of Brain Scratch. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Stay safe, take care, and I'll see you next time on the Geek and Dorks channel.